Some things turn up on the internet that make you go, really? That long ago? Recently it popped up that one of my favourite albums, the Bare Naked Ladies album Stunt, turned 25 years old, as well as the films A Bug's Life, Ants, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, Rush Hour and Goodnight Mr. Tom. But one popped up this morning that made me go, what? No. And that was the yearly tribute to Jules Bianchi, who died on this day in 2015. Although he died in 2015, the race during which he suffered the fatal injuries was nine months prior, in the October of 2014. The Japanese Grand Prix to be precise, and a turning point in a way of how modern open wheelers are designed. Bianchi was considered one of F1's up-and-comers and taking part in his second season of F1 competition. Prior to this, he'd been linked to a couple of full-time F1 drives, most notably being in the running for the Ferrari seat when Felipe Massa suffered his head injuries at the 2009 Hungarian Grand Prix. In 2011, he'd become Ferrari's test driver, replacing the long-serving Giancarlo Fisichella, Luca Badoa and Marc Genet, and was also signed up to Ferrari's Driver Academy, the first person to enter it as well. During his junior career, he raced in Formula 3 and other series, competing against a raft of other drivers who went professional, such as Valtteri Bottas, Esteban Gutierrez, Nico Hülkenberg, Sam Bird, Robert Wickens, Daniel Ricciardo, Brendan Hartley and Nick Tandy, to name eight. Then, for 2013, he got his break. While he wasn't first choice, Bianchi got a seat with the struggling Marussia team after Luis Razzia couldn't get the necessary sponsorship money. On his debut in Australia, he was 19th, 7 tenths ahead of teammate Max Chilton, and then overtook Maldonado and Ricardo on the first lap to go on to finish 15th. Ferrari knew they'd got something here. Then, into the 2014 season, while the media was glued to the whole Silver War thing between Hamilton and Rosberg, Bianchi was quietly plugging away at the back of the grid in a car that was going to struggle due to the sheer amount of money required to run these new hybrid engines. Bianchi finished the first race of the season 8 laps down, and was not classified due to not completing the required 90% race distance. But things reached their peak for Marussia and Bianchi when the Monaco Grand Prix came round in the May of 2014. Once again, all eyes on the Mercedes cars, especially since it was thought Rosberg had deliberately caused yellows to secure pole, but the Marussias were struggling. Eight tenths off getting through into the second part of qualifying. On top of this, Bianchi had to start from the back of the grid because he'd got a gearbox penalty. Either way, the back four positions of the grid were occupied by some sort of combo of the Marussias and Caterhams, barring any other penalties. During the race though, circumstances fell the right way, but Bianchi was able to help the team further by sending it around the outside of the Rascas on lap 36, and picked up some more places when other drivers fell off the road, like Gutierrez, Bottas and Verne, as well as Raikkonen and Magnussen crashing at the hairpin. The ninth place finish was Marussia's first ever points in Formula 1, and as is customary for these back of grid teams, they celebrated like they just won the championship. But it should have been 8th. Bianchi was given a 5 second time penalty because he'd pitted to serve an original time penalty while under the safety car, so they just gave him another one. Because he wasn't able to finish 5 seconds ahead of Grosjean, the two French drivers were swapped on the result sheet. So Marussia and Bianchi were riding a high, and Ferrari was looking at their young driver with keen interest. But all of this was to change in the October of 2014, when they went to the Japanese Grand Prix. Around this time of the season, Hamilton and Rosberg's fight in the championship was hotting up, after retiring from the Belgian Grand Prix because he'd been tagged by Rosberg at Lecom, Hamilton had begun a late season charge that would see him win five races in a row to get himself back into the championship fight, especially since double points were on offer for the final round. The teams and drivers all arrived in Japan with the news that there was a typhoon scheduled to hit Honshu Island on the day of the race, and on race day, the track was absolutely drenched, resulting in the race starting behind the safety car. They did just two laps before coming back into the pits again. While the storm was classed as a Category 4 and was expected to bring winds nudging the 150 mile an hour mark, the storm itself was supposed to miss the circuit, but still bring with it torrential rain. Which, as established, did. Ericsson spun behind the safety car and Hamilton was saying he couldn't see the flashing lights on Rosberg's car or the safety car lights due to the spray. They were stuck in the pits for about 20 minutes before they went back on track, minus Alonso, whose Ferrari had seen its electrical system get fried due to the water. Rain had eased and visibility improved, so on lap 9 the safety car pulled in and the cars went racing, with Hamilton attempting to stick one on Rosberg into turn 1 on the first green flag lap, while Button immediately pitted for the green wall intermediate tyres. Rosberg pitted on lap 14 with Hamilton due to pit the next lap, and Hamilton set fastest first and second sectors to make sure he leapfrogged Rosberg when he did stop but he slid off at Spoon, losing him about a second or so. So when Hamilton got round for his intermediates, Rosberg kept his lead. 
Meanwhile, Hamilton said he was getting warnings about his brakes, dismissed as a sensor issue and not something that caused the problems for both cars in Montreal, while Rosberg was complaining of oversteer. The battle for the lead was the focus of everyone's attention, as on lap 24 the DRS system was turned back on and Hamilton almost immediately binned it. On the entry into Turn 1, the DRS flap was still open, as in normal dry conditions it was possible to turn in with it open, like how they used to go through Aintree at Silverstone, but in the wet it caused Hamilton to get some snap oversteer and he went off into the runoff. But he was more in tune with the conditions and went back after Rosberg at Warp 9, and was back on him by the time they got to the hairpin. At the end of lap 28, Rosberg got a slide on the exit of the final corner, and Hamilton was able to overtake around the outside of Turn 1. On lap 33, Rosberg was in for fresh intermediates, with Hamilton in two laps later, that then gifted the lead to Ricardo. On lap 36, rain fell again and Ricardo pitted and dropped to 5th. On lap 38, Magnussen was off at Turn 1, Vern at Turn 2, and Vettel at the S's, but all continued. On lap 39, DRS was turned off and Hamilton set the fastest lap. On lap 42, Button pitted to take the full wets. On that same lap, Adrian Suttle in the Sauber went off at Dunlop Curve, also Turn 7 and the one shown on your screen for a visual cue. Drivers were also reporting that the combination of the lights and screens on their steering wheels mixed with the rain on their visors was disorientating them as well, and visibility was reaching impossible levels. Suttle had aquaplaned off, his car having no grip at that particular corner, and it just didn't want to go. It spun off and sent him into the tyre barrier. Double waved yellows are brought out, but no safety car was deployed. Suttle's car was lifted by a crane and was slowly being moved towards a gap in the wall to get it out of the way. By this time, Bianchi was coming round again on the next lap. He also aquaplaned at that same corner, but headed straight on towards the crane, which the Marussia hit and went underneath, destroying the roll bar and lifting the crane briefly into the air, while Suttle's car fell to the ground. What's also interesting here is that on Channel 4 and Sky, in the confusion surrounding Sutil and safety cars and yellow flags and everything else, and the later red flag that came out, nobody had noticed for a good chunk of time that Bianchi was no longer in the race. According to the FIA's data, Bianchi hit the tractor at 76 miles an hour at an angle of 55 degrees, and the calculations put together come to an estimated G impact of 254 G. For comparison, Kenny Brack's accident was 214 G at 220 miles an hour. I'll admit, I don't know how all this works. I'm assuming Bianchi's head was like a, a bullwhip in this case. You know when they crack a whip and it, the tip breaks the sand barrier and it's what causes the crack? Yeah, I'm not a doctor. So the red flag was brought out on lap 46, much to the relief of several drivers. Meanwhile, Bianchi was put into an ambulance as the medical helicopter couldn't fly VFR in that weather and was taken to a hospital 10 miles away in Yakaichi, which took 32 minutes to cover 10 miles. When it was revealed that Bianchi had hit the track to recovering Suttil's car, many pointed to footage from the 2007 European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, when F1 viewers collectively held their breath as Vitantonio Liuzzi went off backwards at Turn 1 and glanced off a JCB that was on its way to pull the cars from the gravel trap. Most notably Hamilton's McLaren, who was able to exploit a loophole in the rules, which is probably a good video for another time. Martin Brundle was also critical later on, as during the 1994 race at Suzuka, in heavy conditions and at a time when F1 was on red alert with driver safety, he'd been reprimanded by the FIA after he'd flown off the road and hit a marshal that was recovering Gianni Morbidelli's footwork, ironically at the same corner that Suttil and Bianchi had gone off at. The reprimand wasn't for hitting the marshal, it was for saying, why was that marshal and that recovery truck there while we're still going at racing speeds? We needed a safety car at that point. Ooh, that's another race to do. 94 Suzuka, Damon's best drive. So the investigation began into what had happened that afternoon. The analysis of the onboard computers detailed that when Bianchi left the track, he hit the brakes, which did nothing because they just locked and he continued sliding. At some point, he also pushed down on the throttle, which should have caused the failsafe system to activate, which would automatically cut the throttle and just let the brakes do the work but the Marussia had a brake-by-wire system bespoke to that car that prevented failsafe from kicking in. The reports also stated that Bianchi had not slowed down sufficiently for the yellow flags, having left the track at around 130 miles an hour. Whether this was due to him being dazzled by the mix of water and lights on his wheel that we discussed earlier, we'll never know. It would also be interesting to see other drivers' speeds through that corner on that lap, just to see if anybody else had slowed down, because Formula 1 cars... Fast ego, more downforce, more grip, etc. 
Race director Charlie Whiting had also spoken to race organisers and the FIA about the possibility of moving the race start time forward to try and reduce the disruption that the typhoon would have caused. Because of the Russian Grand Prix in Sochi the following Sunday, it was impossible to shift the race to the Monday due to the logistics of moving all the freight to the next race. The Japanese organisers and circuit owners Honda said no due to the published times already being finalised. Apparently in Japan, if you say you're turning up at 2pm, you're turning up at 2pm. It's probably why all their trains and buses are on time to within like 10 seconds. Whiting was overruled by the FIA as well due to the TV scheduling. Bernie had also tried to move the start time but later said, no, this is going ahead as planned. Mikasalo, one of the race stewards that day, defended the decision to not bring out the safety car, while others said that not bringing out the safety car was a huge mistake. Later on, a 10-person panel made up of ex-drivers and team principals determined that there was no singular cause of the accident and started to make recommendations to try and avoid a repeat. The first was to amend Appendix H, which contains the rules regarding double-waved yellows. This later became the virtual safety car. Any safety-critical software had to be reviewed by the FIA to make sure it was compatible with things like failsafe. Guidelines to improve circuit drainage were proposed, and recommendations to not have races during the local rainy season. Provisions were going to be made to Pirelli as well to do wet weather testing. And for reference, the members of that panel were Ross Braun, Stefano Domenicali, Gerd Enzer, the chief steward, Emerson Fittipaldi, Eduardo Freitas, the WEC race director, Roger Pert of ASN Canada, Antonio Rigozzi of the FIA International Court of Appeal, Gerard Salant of the FIA's Medical Commission, and Alex Wirtz, the president of the GPDA. In all, it was determined to be one catastrophic accident with no singular point of failure, a culmination of things that with each one brought more and more of an outcome, if that makes any sense. The Bianchi family tried to sue Formula One for the avoidable accident, saying the report did nothing to determine what actually went wrong, with Marussia and the Bianchi family being angered by the suggestion that Bianchi was going too fast for the conditions. As is often the case with motor racing, things have to go catastrophically wrong to get things to change. It's why the term tombstone technology is applied to things that have evolved on Formula 1 cars, road cars and aircraft in terms of the safety aspect of things. But it is safe to say the FIA had at least two warnings regarding recovery vehicles on or in close proximity to the track. Those two warnings being 1994 with Brundle at the same corner on the same track and the European Grand Prix of 2007. On top of that, in horrendous conditions last year, Pierre Gasly was shocked to see a recovery vehicle moving Sainz's Ferrari and kicked off about it. Or it was Albon's Williams, you can't see anything through that spray, and was then fined for driving too fast under red flag conditions, with the bit about the recovery vehicle just, just washed under the carpet. Despite Gasly, Perez, Latifi and Alex Wirtz all saying, why was that there? It also didn't help that the yellow flag flashing on the track side turned to red as Gasly got to it. But the injuries sustained by Bianchi were too much. Nine months after the accident, on the 17th of July 2015, Bianchi passed away in Nice. It's assumed that he would have ended up taking one of the Ferrari seats, either replacing Alonso or Raikkonen. But who knows, maybe it would be him and his godson Leclerc in that car now. But anyway, a look at the events surrounding the 2014 Japanese Grand Prix. If this has been something new for you, then like the video if you've learned something from this. And for more deep dives into the motorsport history books, then get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Massive thanks to the people of Patreon for the continued support. If you want to help support the channel at a more personal level, then you can do so by following the link in the description, but there's also links to Discord and my socials, as well as the F1 store affiliate link. And super thanks too if you just want to buy me a beer. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.